Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, editor of Foreign Affairs, and welcome to another edition of Foreign Affairs Focus. Today we have the great good fortune to speak with Sarah Holowinski, who's the director of the Center for Civilians in Conflict and the author of Do Less Harm, Protecting and Compensating Civilians in War, a great article from our JanFeb issue. So Sarah, uh, what is the basic problem of harming civilians in combat? Isn't just war hell and bad things happen? War is hell, bad things happen always has since humans emerged. Um, but in recent conflicts, the real problem is that it's a strategic uh, loss to warring parties if they harm civilians and if they don't do anything about it. The interesting thing is that in the laws of war, a warring party can just walk away from civilian harm that they've created. So you can't harm civilians directly or deliberately, but if they happen to get harmed in the course of otherwise legitimate military operations, the law says, tough luck, that's okay? That's exactly right. So if I am targeting a weapons pile next to your home, and I happen to hit your home, and the weapons pile was considered a military objective, then I, as a military, do not have to come back and say, I'm sorry, I don't have to explain to your family, I don't have to give you any compensation, no rebuilding of your home. So why isn't it enough just for the military to say, look, we want to keep clear of war crimes, we don't do war crimes, but these aren't war crimes, we're really sorry. It goes back to that awful phrase that everyone's been using for so long, hearts and minds. But if you lose the hearts and minds by ignoring civilian harm, by first of all causing civilian harm and then ignoring it, um, that can cripple your mission. So we've seen that happen over and over in Afghanistan, in Iraq, even going back to Vietnam. So the causing of harm to civilians, even as a result of legitimate military operations, can have negative consequences. And you say that in your piece that the U.S. military, in the course of the Afghan and Iraqi wars, realized that this was having problems and developed sort of ad hoc strategies for dealing with it. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that the United States learns lessons pretty well in war. The military learns lessons pretty well. Um, and after some years of civilian harm being caused, of you know people out in the streets chanting death to America with their placards um, because of civilian casualties and not getting compensated, for example, um, the U.S. military, particularly commanders on the ground, said, we've got to do something about this. You know, this is really crippling our mission. So part of our mission is going to be reducing civilian harm and then addressing it properly when it happens. So what did they do? So for example, um, created a civilian casualty tracking cell in Afghanistan. This sounds very technical and it is, but warring parties throughout history haven't actually taken record of the kinds of civilian harm that they're causing. Once you actually jot it down and you say, this is how many civilian casualties we caused last month. Here's where they were. This is why they happened. Then you can get better and better. And you can also know where you need to go to say, here's what actually happened to that family and we're going to compensate them. What about payments, uh, compensation for victims? Have they been doing that? They have been doing that, although it's a very ad hoc process. What's interesting is that the U.S. military has been paying these kinds of, you can call it compensation, but it's not an actual legal term. Um, they've been making amends to civilians, Vietnam, Korea, Grenada, and then in Iraq and Afghanistan. The problem was they didn't do it for a good number of years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then finally came around. And those years, um, and we've interviewed civilians who have been harmed by U.S. forces during those years, were incredibly angry. And then when they actually got help, you could see the switch in their mindsets. And they would say things to me like, now I know that America didn't mean to harm my family because they came back and they did something about the harm that they caused. So we've now solved the problem and everything's fine, right? That would be great, but no. <laughs> um, so none of these policies are standing policies. In fact, you could just call them practices. So tracking civilian harm, doing proper investigations, paying out amends, compensation, whatever you want to call it. These are things that took place in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they are not part of our Department of Defense, for example. So if we need to go into another place with ground forces next year, all of this would have to be recreated. So the 
need now is to institutionalize these practices in the uniform military and in U.S. government policy more generally? Absolutely. So policies, legislation, doctrine, military training, you know, our forces who are now coming through the ranks need to know how important civilian protection and addressing harm is way before they ever get out into a combat theater. Do you see any evidence that this kind of learning is taking place? A little bit. Only a little bit. Um, and I'm not optimistic, actually, that we are going to get the kinds of standing policies that we want because the United States is now transitioning from massive ground forces in a place to counterterrorism operations. And that means three things. Special forces, drones, and partnering with local forces all around the world. All three of those come with really significant civilian protection challenges. Why? What do you mean by that? Well, special forces don't have a good track record um, of abiding by the kinds of practices that we would like to see in avoiding civilians. And certainly special forces in a place won't go back and compensate. Um, most of them don't like to be known to have been there anyway. Partnering with local forces, um, there's a lot of training going on, Uganda, Colombia, these places from U.S. trainers helping local forces they're not really training on civilian protection, at least not in the way that we would like to see it and not in a robust manner. Um, so those forces then go out and can cause civilian harm and it reflects badly on America. And then of course the drones debate, um, which is huge and could take all day. But there is um, a question of what kind of civilian harm is being caused by drones. And because we're not there with ground forces, we once again cannot address the harm that we do cause. Has the response to your piece made you any more optimistic about this stuff? Um, I think people are starting to talk about it a little more, and specifically because of the foreign affairs piece. Um, and I did, um, I was over at the Pentagon talking about these issues just last week. But it really takes, a, you know, it's a, it's a large bureaucracy, and it's tough to move. Um, so it's going to take a lot of committed individuals at the Pentagon to say, this is something we need to focus on. We're going to put resources behind it and we're gonna get it done now. Because once we're out of Afghanistan, the focus is going to be off of this. So we have a very short window in which to create these kinds of standing policies. Sarah Holowinski, Executive Director of the Center for Civilians in Conflict, thanks for talking to us on this edition of Foreign Affairs Focus. We'll see you next time.